is off. It clamps down when attacked, as if held by suction. At the touch of an ant, the beetle's reaction is immediate. There's nothing for the ant to grab. The legs and antennae are safely tucked away. The ant perseveres, but so does the beetle. A momentary lapse on the part of the beetle and the ant strikes, grasping the edge of the beetle's shell. But the beetle keeps its hold. Its body is obviously not a suction cup. A trivial observation, but a clue to Eisner that it held on with those funny feet. They are large for a reason. Its very life depends on them. Although the ant struggles furiously to pry the beetle off, leverage doesn't seem to work. Eisner timed the persistence of the ants. They usually give up in less than a minute. The beetle's endurance is longer. It nearly always emerges the winner, none the worse for the experience. So there was more to the beetle than met the eye. Eisner looked again. I needed to know what those feet looked like and exactly how they worked. And I wanted to get some real idea of the beetle's clinging power. I got a feel for that by pretending to be an ant. I tickled the beetle and it responded beautifully. But in these days of technology, there are better and more scientific ways of making measurements. Well, the beetle's still in its vial, clinging very nicely in the palmetto. The question now is, how hard does he cling? And since he won't talk to us, we're going to try to persuade him to work with us. And to do that, I'm going to attach him to a little wire hook with a droplet of wax, which I'm going to melt, put on his back, My goodness, he's not even letting go of the palmetto. There we go. I'm gonna take him now and make him part of a very ingenious engineering experiment designed by my colleague, Dan. I'm hanging him by a little hook where he's now suspended above a platform of palmetto, which I'm raising to bring it in contact with his feet. And what we're going to do electronically now is to pull the ground from under him with an electromagnet, which pulls on this platform here. The pull is registered by this instrument here and displayed on this oscilloscope. Why don't we get it started? OK. The pull is beginning. It's rising. Still holding on, rising, rising, one gram, there he goes, beautiful. Well, I think we should try the same beetle again. Let's release the pull from the platform. Let's bring it up to horizontal. He's attached again, I'm gonna start to pull. It's very, we're getting up to one. He's still holding. One and a half. He's passing two, still holding. Two and a half. Almost three, three, and that's it. Well, 10 milligram beetle, three grams. That's 300 times its body weight. Can you imagine hanging from the ceiling by your feet? with an automobile in each hand. Well, the remaining question is, how does he hold on? And one possibility, of course, is that he has hooks and that he uses hooks to anchor himself. Well, if that's the case, he should not be able to hold on to glass. 
Well, let's just see whether he can lift glass. Well, he obviously can. Well, let's see if he can lift an even bigger piece than that. Marvelous. So hooks cannot be involved. There has to be some other mechanism that he uses. One possibility, of course, that he uses a glue. But it doesn't have to be a glue. All one has to do to lift one solid with another solid is to have a thin intervening film of a liquid. You can lift a piece of glass with another piece of glass by just having a drop of water between them. And we can do that right here. Put a droplet of water on a piece of glass, squeeze that droplet, and I can lift. Well, the beetle does just that with his feet. So, what are its feet like? Through a microscope, the beetle's six feet loom large. At higher magnification, each foot begins to reveal its structure. It's made up of thousands of bristles. At even higher magnification, under the electron microscope, the detail is resolved. Each tip is forked with two contact pads at the end. Remove the beetle, and where it set its feet is a print of thousands of droplets, each a drop of oil. And that's the secret of its adherence. The oil oozes from tiny wells at the base of the bristles, then seeps into the space between them and onto the tips. So it wets the pads. Each pad is a tiny version of the wetted glass disc, but wetted by oil instead of water. Under attack, it's those discs that give the beetle its staying power. A few bristles couldn't hold tight, but the beetle has 60,000 ready for instant action. So the defensive chemical is neither poison nor repellent, just a harmless yet vital oil. Some animals have even more bizarre answers to defense. The creature shielded beneath this tangled wood is the larva of Hemispherota. It starts life as a large egg coated with a protective encrustment of its mother's fecal pellets. The larva emerges naked, but immediately begins to feed on the rather unnutritious palmetto. What it can't digest, it voids, but doesn't get rid of it. It uses the feces to build up a dry string thatch all over it. One by one, the emerging strands curl round and produce an impregnable shield. Predators can't break through, or they ignore it, unaware of the morsel beneath. The larva seems very energy conscious. It recycles plant materials at no cost to itself, and so doesn't waste valuable energy in creating its own defensive poisons. Plants themselves are often chemically protected. It's not in their interests either to get eaten. Few animals will attempt to feed on this plant, camphor weed. But one insect is undeterred and visits it not to eat, but to exploit it. It's called apiomerus. The leaves and stalks of camphor weed are covered by thousands of tiny droplets of tacky resin that reek of camphor, a powerful insect repellent. Apiomerus seeks out this plant and laboriously harvests the droplets. It's found an economic way of getting hold of its defensive chemicals by stealing rather than by making them. First, it scrapes up the secretion with its front legs and wipes it onto the middle pair. Then, it slowly removes it with its hind legs and plasters it all over its belly. There, it gradually builds up to form a pasty coating.
Only the female performs this painstaking task. It is, in fact, a labor of love. On laying her eggs, she coats them with a layer of the goo, so they're sticky and protected. What works for the plant against plant eaters now protects her eggs against egg eaters. There are few plant eaters on pines. The aromatic scent and stickiness that's familiar to us all is the pine's protection, resin. But a few insects, like the sawfly larvae, can cope with it. They eat the pine needles that separate the resin, storing it harmlessly just within the mouth in a protectively lined sack. There, it lies in readiness for the larva's defense. A larva can instantly burp up its droplet of resin, and the repellent takes effect. The smell drives off the ant, and if it gets glue on its legs, it may get permanently entangled. The droplet is eased out, but danger over is sucked in again and held for later use. Few of us realize how many plants are protected by their own chemicals. The milkweed is no exception. It squirts out its poison when injured, but again, some insects are undeterred. Some caterpillars, including those of the monarch butterfly, even accumulate the chemicals in their bodies and retain them as they grow and develop. So, as butterflies, they themselves are laden with the poisons, beneficiaries of what they gained in their youth. Many insects use the same strategy. If an insect has evolved a way of being insensitive to a plant's poisons, what better than to use these poisons in its own defense against others? Eisner and his colleagues have made a detailed study of one moth that lives on a poisonous legume. And the research turned out to have an unexpected twist. The moth is called Utathysa. We first noticed that the caterpillars of Utathysa competed for the seeds of the plant. That's where the poisons are concentrated, and they're very potent. Chemically, they're a type of alkaloid, bitter and highly toxic to us. The caterpillar chews its way into the pod and eats the whole seed. When the larvae are crowded on the plant, there may be winners and losers in this competition. Those best able to break into the pod may end up with the most poisonous alkaloid in their bodies. And as an adult, the moth retains them. Unlike many other moths that remain hidden by day, Utathysa risks exposure. The poisonous alkaloids are its defense, the coloration its warning. Red, white, and yellow make it extremely conspicuous. Bright and attractive, it lives in a world full of many dangers. Utathysa has problems with spiders. If it flies into an orb of a spider, it might be eaten. It may have problems with bats. And, of course, it may have problems with birds. Birds are among the major enemies of Udasaisa. They feed on many insects. And these scrub jays, in particular, are aggressive toward insects that come within sight. Eisner tested the moth's palatability. He offered the scrub jays edible and inedible insects. First, a tasty moth. Do you like a moth? It's eaten with relish. Now the jay is given a choice. Edible insects in the palm and an utathysa between thumb and forefinger. All but utathysa are taken. The warningly coloured moth is undoubtedly seen but ignored and it'll survive another day. 